Okay, and it's good that you saw that we're not plugging anything in for VF because that's the unknown. That's what we're trying to figure out. Well, it's good to have an equation that's got this variable in it because that's what we're trying to figure out. What should we plug in for UF? Well, since it's only the instant before it hits the ground, it has negligible height. So we can, we can say that that height is zero. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's, a kind of, that's a kind of a confusing philosophical question that trips students up a lot. But for all practical purposes, we can say that the instant before we hit the ground, our height is zero. So this would be zero. Remember that uh, a couple minutes ago, um, one of you thought that this energy should be negative. But we can see that wouldn't make sense. Um, the energy has to be higher up here than it is on the ground, because things are less happy when they're up here. So if this is going to be a zero energy, this has to be a positive energy to show that the object is less happy when it's further from the ground. After all, what we want to show is that the object is getting happier, right? It's moving to a lower energy. Well, to show that, we have to show it's moving from a positive energy to zero. So it does make sense to put in the magnitude of g here. Okay, very good. Now what? Now you say 294 equals 2.5 yes. So let's finish off the problem. Since they were asking for the final velocity, we haven't given a full answer unless we've given both a magnitude and a direction. So what would be the direction in words here? Down. Yeah, down. <laughs> From our common sense, we know that the instant before we hit the ground, we're moving down. If we choose up as our positive direction, we could also say that the velocity was negative, 10.8. But if we chose down as the positive direction, the velocity would be positive 10.8. So the simplest thing is to say it's 10.8 meters per second down. On a test, do we have to say down or whatever? Or, I mean, do we have to like define which way is positive and which way is negative? Or in a question like this, can we just say 10.8? Well, if they actually ask you for what is the final velocity? Well, since velocity is a vector, you haven't given a full answer unless you've given both the magnitude and the direction. So technically, you should give both the magnitude and the direction. But uh, again, the, the instructor will probably be nicer about that than I would be inclined to be. Usually the instructor will say something like, what is the magnitude and the direction of the final velocity to remind you that you need the direction as well. They're usually not going to say, what's the velocity, and then say, oh, you forgot the direction, and take off points for that. Even, even though, in my mind, that would be perfectly fair. But they, they think that's a little uh, too mean. So you probably won't just see a question that says, they might say something like, what's the final speed? Well, if they just say the final speed, you certainly don't need to give the direction, because speed is just a magnitude. But um, if they talk about the velocity, they'll probably specifically say magnitude and direction. Um, if they don't say that, if they just say, what is the final velocity, to be on the safe side, you should give the direction. But I would be surprised if they took off points for leaving that out there. Usually what they say on the test is, what is the magnitude and the direction of the vector, just to give students a little extra help to remember to do that. OK. Uh, anyway, when you're doing homework problems, though, whether the question asks for it or not, you might as well always ask what the direction is, just to practice uh, thinking about those things. All right, so now we're done with this problem. Well, we started with a pretty simple problem here, but the key is to show the general approach for this type of problem. So I want, what I want to kind of convince you is, remember last time we just did a whole bunch of Newton's second law problems where we just kept using this equation over and over. And what I was trying to convince you is that they were all kind of the same. Some were more complicated than others, but they were all the same. You identified all the forces on the object, and then you just plugged them into the left-hand side for Newton's second law. Well, how does that relate to what we're doing here? Now, Instead of identifying all the forces and plugging them in, we're identifying all the work by the non-conservative forces and plugging them in to this equation. But you still need to start by finding the forces because the work comes from the forces. So on a, if we get a question like this and it just says find the final velocity, do you think it's easier? 
empirically use this approach or like vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ax? You get oh, the same yeah. answer, right? That's a, that's a really good point. So what you're pointing out is that you could have solved this using basically kinematics. Yeah. You could just treat this like a projectile motion problem. Yeah, excellent. So it's good that you saw that you could treat this like a projectile motion problem. Well, for this problem, you should do it whichever way seems simpler. So you write this one, you could do either way. Uh, but maybe the, I think the next problem I'm going to give you is something similar to this where kinematics won't work. Um, the reason is, remember that kinematics only works when the acceleration is constant, which means it only works when you have a constant force. Well, in this case, we do have constant forces because the weight is constant. Um, but um, you can easily see problems where the force is changing, and then the acceleration is changing, and you can't use the kinematics approach that you learned before, and then you've got to use work. Um, but when you can choose either one, you should choose whichever one is easier. At this point in the course, um, you should be doing things using work because that's what you're trying to learn. Uh, but it would be good practice if you see that something can also be solved by kinematics to do it both ways just to check yourself so that you don't forget about kinematics because that will be on the test as well. But you're right, there are problems that can be solved either using kinematics or work, so it's good that you thought about that. All right, but again, the general framework here is now identify all the forces on the object. And for every force, decide how much work it's doing and plug it in over here. Well, remember that if it's a conservative force, it doesn't get plugged into here at all. And that's all that we had in this case. Uh, and then we saw that if energy is being conserved, this is the most useful formula to use. When energy is being conserved, we can just say k initial plus u initial equals k final plus u final. Uh, and then we just plug in these individual terms. Notice how many things ended up being zero here. You gotta watch out for things that are zero when you're doing conservation of energy. If you start at rest, ki will be zero. If you come to rest, k final will be zero. Um, if you're on the ground, your potential energy would be zero. So watch for things that are zero that will simplify this equation. And then we just plug in. Okay, make sense? Okay.